This is Mark Locke's Extension Wheat Scientist at The Ohio State University, and this is the second in our series of videos uh, giving instruction on how to determine herbicide site of action diversity. In this video, we'll talk about how to do it for specific weeds. So if you haven't watched the previous video uh, that basically goes through the herbicide classification chart and how to determine what your site of action is for your herbicide program, that's probably worth a review first. So just uh, as a reminder, we are using this chart as well as the OSU Weed Control Guide uh, to do this type of uh, classification. So when we look at specific uh, weeds in terms of determining site of action, um, there's a couple of things sort of to keep in mind. One is um, you have to know uh, which herbicides have su substantial activity on a weed and you need to use um, either your common knowledge of that or and or the university weed control guides where you can look at the chart. And we're, we're basically assuming anything that's rated at least a seven has relatively substantial activity. Um, you also need to know what types of resistance are already present in the population. So if you have a population that's already glyphosate resistant, obviously, you know, that's a site of action that is not going to work on that weed, and you need to look at uh, that column in the weed control guide or keep that in mind. Beyond that, if you're going to go through this exercise for specific weeds, it's probably worth thinking about the ones that are more problematic and the ones that we treat more often during a season because of their long emergence pattern or their just difficulty in control. So, you know, you can look at a weed like lamb squatters, which is relatively easily controlled most of the time by residual herbicides. Is it worth doing, you know, this exercise for that weed? Possibly not. When you look at the weeds that um, we either already have resistance to or, the, or we tend to develop resistance to or are just otherwise problematic, you can see the ones on the bottom of the slide there. You know, mare's tail, giant ragweed, water hemp, palm, ramaranth. Foxtail is another one that really has not developed glyphosate resistance to speak of, but um, we certainly do spray it a lot with glyphosate. So that would be another one maybe you would consider going through. And you can obviously pick any way to do this exercise, but we would typically suggest you focus on the ones that are most problematic. So if you watched the previous video, this chart looks familiar. I'm going to walk through the same series of uh, changes in herbicide use over two years. In the first year is no-till soybeans with a burn down followed by residual and sometimes post, depending on the program, and then the second year is conventional tilled corn, so we have no burn down. Um, so if you look at the, the first three columns in this chart, um, we did that, went through that, um, how to come up with that in the previous video. So you can see we have a total of two sites of action in the beans and a total of three in the corn, a total of four over the two years. When you come back and actually look at which herbicides in the system have activity on given weeds, one of the things you have to determine in a no-till situation is whether that weed has emerged at the time of the burn down. And John Foxtail for us typically hasn't, um, and a number of other weeds also haven't. So I, you know, I'm indicating that by a dash here. So we're sort of throwing out the burn down in terms of whether it contributes anything to the site of number of sites of action on giant Foxtail and other weeds that emerge after your burn down. So you can go down through, and what I'm essentially doing is carrying over so if a, a given herbicide and application has activity on that weed, I'm just carrying over that same site of action number into the next column. So for example, in the no-till soybeans, the burn down gets thrown out for foxtail and then Roundup or glyphosate obviously has activity on giant foxtail. So I'm keeping it in there. When I come down to the corn for giant foxtail, atrazine has some activity. So does the S. or and so does the glyphosate. So we end up with a total of one in the soybean year and then three in the corn year, but we have overlap. We're using glyphosate in both the corn and the beans, so we can only count it once, so we have a total of three um, down at the bottom. Um, and where you get this information, um, and also for the giant ragweed is, especially for premixes, you're going to go to the chart, look under giant foxtail, and so if it's glyphosate, you can obviously just look up glyphosate or if it's clarity or whatever in the chart, and it'll give you the rating. Here we hear for the premixes, sometimes an extra step's necessary, so um, in some cases, you have to look at like the giant ragweed here on the far right. Metallochlor plus atrazine is the generic way we list bicep, and it's an 8, and so is atrazine, and the metallochlor is a dash. So it tells you the atrazine is the herbicide there that really has the giant ragweed activity. If you come over and look at the giant foxtail category, you can see we still give atrazine a 7 and the metallochlor a 9, so they both have um, activity there. So you're basically going to use the ratings in the chart to determine this. Um, and when you do this, then I, I went through the giant foxtail, the giant ragweed is emerged at the time of the burn down. So we have the glyphosate and 2,4-D active on it, glyphosate post, and then coming down to the corn, just the atrazine component in the corn pre, and then the glyphosate post. So you've got two sites of action in year one, two in year two, but a total of three because we're using, again, glyphosate uh, over the two years. Not a lot of diversity there, really. 
Um, if, as in the previous video, we add Valor XLT, um, we have to go through the same exercise. So we look at giant foxtail and see Valor XLT and Valor. Neither one of them have any foxtail activity to speak of. Giant ragweed, we come over and we give Valor XLT a 7. Um, we do not list Valor XLT. The two components are Clemuron and Valor. We do not list Clemuron by itself in the pre-emergence table. But by process of elimination, you look at the Valor rating, which is a dash, and then you come back and you say, okay, the 7 from the Valor XLT pretty much has to be due to the Clemuron or Classic that's in there. So if we add them in there, it really doesn't do anything for our Foxtail column, but for our Giant Ragweed column, we add a, the activity from the Classic, so we add a site of action. The first year still have um, one unique site of action, the Astrazine the second year, so we have a total of four. We still just have three for the, for the Foxtail. If you start to make some other changes, for example, here we're adding Clarity to the corn program to try to get another site of action in there. Um, Clarity doesn't have any activity on Foxtail, so our, our Foxtail numbers are still unchanged. Um, Clarity does have activity on Giant Ragweed, so now we have um, actually three sites of action in the beans and three in the corn. This is an example that I used in the previous video where Clarity and 2,4-D are both site of action number four, so we only count them once even though Really, they do affect plants in different ways, but we still have a two-year total of four, um, knowing that we're not, we have a little bit more diversity than is indicated by that number, probably. Um, you know, another way to do that is to decide, okay, I'm going to use a post-emergence that doesn't rely on glyphosate at all where I can, and, and so we're switching up here in the corn and switching an impact, which is to a pramazone, which gives us another site of action group number 27. Um, which does have activity on foxtail, so we bump up to three sites of action on the corn on foxtail, still one in the soybeans, just the glyphosate for a two-year total of four. Um, impact also has activity on giant ragweed, so we have three sites of action on giant ragweed in the first year, and now we have two in the second year of corn, so we have a two-year total of five, and we've obviously de-emphasized uh, our glyphosate post in the corn. Um, then we can start to do some other things, uh, especially as we start to have some issues possibly with glyphosate uh, resistance. But here we'll add Flexstar to the uh, post-soybean program, um, which again doesn't have any foxtail activity. So compared to the previous slide where we just added impact, we're still at a total of four over the two years for foxtail. But it does have activity on giant ragweed. So now in the bean year, we have four different sites of action. Uh, on giant ragweed two in the corn year. So now we have a total of six actually over the two years uh, for giant ragweed. If we start to look at actually resistance, so as soon as we have resistance, we have to throw out that particular site of action. So in this case, if you look at the top of the slide, we're saying we have group nine resistance in giant ragweed, which is glyphosate. Um, so when we go through this exercise, I've kicked out the foxtail here just to keep it simple. And look at giant ragweed, you can see the, the post glyphosate the burn down and both the posts, the glyphosate use there falls out. It did not carry over the site of action. So now we just have two sites of action in the in the bean year and one in the corn year because this goes back to our original herbicide program of just glyphosate, just bicep followed by glyphosate. So we have a two year total of three. And then what we have to do, of course, in this case is make a modification to our program to control glyphosate resistant giant ragweed. And so, you know, what we can do is add first rate post emergence. That's one of the first things a lot of people do. Um, which gives us uh, some help post-emergence um, or, or a non-glyphosate herbicide post-emergence. But um, it's the Clemuron or Classic and the Valor XLT that's given us some, some control pre-emergence, and that's a 2, and the post-first rate's a 2. So we've actually added a herbicide, but we have not increased our number of sites of action in the beans. Um, and then we still have 2 in the, in the corn if we're using Clarity, for example, post in the corn. So we have a total of 3. Um, over the two years. So this is an example of why we get ALS resistance developing um, in giant ragweed populations sometimes because we're using ALS pre and then we're one of the first solutions post-emergence is to try to use first trader classic which is also a group 2 or ALS inhibitor. Um, and that does lead us to have sometimes multiple resistance. So in this case we're saying the giant ragweed is multiple resistant to both groups 2 and 9. And so if you go back to that previous slide, we have to remove all the glyphosate and all the ALS or group 2, and we're left only with the 2,4-D uh, and the burn down that's giving us some control, and then we still have two 
sites of action in corn, but we have overlap between the clarity and the 240s. So we have a two-year total of two. And again, because we have this resistance, we have to make a modification to the program. And the first modification that's made here would either be a swap to Liberty Link soybeans, where we're probably going to use Liberty Spray twice post-emergence, or something like this, where we're using Flexstar in the first post application and coming back with Cobra. In the second application, they're both group 14 herbicides. Um, so we've increased in order to control the giant ragweed with this type of resistance. You know, we we're using we have two sites of action in beans, the 2,4-D and the burn down, and the PPO inhibitors are the group 14 in the post-emergence. But we have a total of two sites of action, and we're using group 14 twice uh, to control almost all the giant ragweed for that year. And we still have two in corn for a two-year total of three still with the overlap between the 2,4-D and the dicamba. Um, so that's just sort of a quick and dirty look at um, how to figure out site of action for specific weeds. If you have any uh, questions, you can always uh, give us a call or give us an email. Um, and there's other information in the weed control guide and also on the website here that can be helpful.